Ladies and gentlemen, our special guest today on the Beginner's Mind series is Mr. Adrian Gostick, who's a successful business author and thought leader and helps businesses to retain employees and increase performance. His advice is simple. Listen to what your people have to say and praise them for it. This straightforward message has produced remarkable results for several leading organizations across the world and has put Adrian in the bestsellers list and in high demand as a speaker and a thought leader across the world. He's an expert on global workplace and thought leader in the fields of corporate culture, leadership, and employee engagement. His work is supported by solid research and reveals the proven secrets of why some cultures and some teams break through and others don't. And we will explore that in detail as well. His bestsellers, All In, The Carrot Principle, and The Best Team Wins has been translated into 30 languages across the world, sold more than 1.5 million copies in 2022. Adrian was ranked number four on the list of the top 30 global gurus in leadership. And it is such a pleasure to have him with us here today on the Beginner's Mind Show. Please join me welcoming Adrian with a round of virtual applause. Well, thank you. Thank you, Simarjeet. And thank you, everybody. Yeah, I love the, uh, love the introduction. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, sir, and we appreciate you taking out the time at a very short notice to join us for, for this discussion. Let me also take a moment to thank all the people behind the scenes who make all these content that we produce at a breakneck speed, who make all of this work possible. You know, the editors, the graphic designers, the people who schedule these interviews, so on and so forth. Um, thank you to all of you. Thank you to our listeners and our viewers as well. Um, Adrian, uh, I hope through a uh, conversation today we can simplify, and, and, and I love people who simplify, and I read that in, in, in your introduction. I was like, wow, you know, I would love to hear this. I hope we can simplify today some of the secrets of um, teamwork, employee engagement and leadership, because these are challenging times where I was speaking to a business leader the other day who said, majority of business leaders want people to come back to work and majority of employees don't want to come back to work. And <laughs> these are tough times as far as retention and this war for talent and there's so much going on. Um, let's begin first by, by taking a deep dive into this question. Why is that some cultures and teams break through and others don't through your several years of your research? What are probably the factors that you feel distinguish uh, these two groups, the, the haves and the yeah, have-nots? Yeah, and, and no, thanks, Simarjeet. You know, it's a big question, and it's an important one. You know, the idea is, you know, what have we found in all our research? So for the last 20 years, we've now surveyed with research partners more than a million employees around mm -hmm. the world. We have mm -hmm. India, we have China, we have Brazil, we have UK, Germany, we have the US, Canada. We've got countries around the world, and what sure. are we finding? We're finding that there are really differences in those high performance cultures. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I, we've been talking about employee engagement for, for decades now. Uh, the problem is employee engagement numbers aren't really going up. Now, right. what other business concept do we know that, uh, that we can't really move no matter what we do? Mm -hmm. Well, what we found, especially in tough times, that there are accelerators that move engagement levels. Right. If you focus only on engagement, you won't move engagement. You may move it slightly, but things will settle back down. Uh -huh. There are other forces that are used to move engagement, and that's what we found in our research. The first is this idea we call enablement. Okay. Um, in order for me to feel engaged, if I work for you, you uh -huh. have to enable me. That's right. bigger than empowerment. Sure. It means that I'm supported. I have the right training, the right tools and equipment at my disposal. Mm -hmm. I do feel empowered. Mm -hmm. I feel enabled, but I feel supported right. uh, mentally, physically, with all the tools and equipment that I need. Mm -hmm. If I'm empowered, if I'm engaged but not enabled, I'm a little like a hamster spinning on a wheel. I've got nowhere sure. to go. Right. The other accelerator we found was this idea of energy. Now, mm -hmm. I know it sounds obvious, but what we found is being energized means that I have a, a very strong connection to our mission, our purpose. Right. Um, there's, there's good work-life balance. I'm not feeling completely burned out. There may be bubbles of work, right. but there are times where I'm able to focus in on with my family or my, my tribe, my, the people that are important to me. Sure. These three ideas have to work together. Uh -huh. We can't just focus on engaged. We right. have to focus on enabled and energy as well. Those are the three E's we found mm -hmm. that were in every high performance organization. And right. we also found steps that drive those, but those three E's are where we start. 
I love the fact that you point out enabling because this is something that's often overlooked in the entire emphasis on let's empower our people and without them being enabled to, you know, use something or change something without having any discretion at all, <clears throat> it doesn't make any difference at the ground level. Um, I read this something about Ritz Carlton enabling their employees with, I think it's, I don't know, when I read it, it was about $400 per employee yeah. can yeah. wave off or, you know, if, if the guest did not have a good night's sleep even the person making the room, the housekeeper uh, for that particular um, floor can make a decision and take some action on that. Um, what other examples, um, Adrian, in your perspective are there of organizations em enabling their employees? Well, I just love that you picked on Ritz Carlton because we've seen that and we've worked with the Ritz and, okay. and you're exactly right. They, mm -hmm. they do have, and every employee will tell a story. I remember we, mm -hmm. we talked with one of the maintenance people who found right. out that this couple was on their honeymoon. And, uh, and so he, he created this wonderful experience where one of them was in a wheelchair. And so he, he created a way for them to get to the beach and oh, he, wow. it was just uh, you know, went above and beyond. That was just wow. so touching and remarkable. Uh -huh. My favorite story, though, of the Ritz Carlton, one of our trainers. So we have a team of trainers who go around the world and right. train on our concepts. And one of our trainers, his name is Chris, and he's a big guy. He's six foot five. And he sends me a text one day. He's a, it's eight in the morning and his pants have ripped from from the ankle all the way up to, to his hip and mm. his pants, the seam has ripped. And he's right. six foot five. You don't just run down to the local store. It's eight o'clock. He's about right. to go on stage and he's panicked. Oops. He goes, what Oops. do I do? And I go, right. I, <laughs> and, I, and I tell him, look, you know, relax, Chris. He says, the only other pants I brought are sweats. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'm going and so, live on stage. It's not a virtual presentation. <laughs> exactly. Right. And so the Ritz Carlton, the, the event planner saw how panicked he was, came over and said, what's going on? And he explained, and she goes, give me five minutes. Oh, wow. Chris texts me in five minutes. He's wearing a new pair of blue pants. Wow. Um, and he says, uh, this event planner ran around the, the hotel, found a maintenance man who was about the same height, borrowed the pants, wow. and uh, borrowed an extra pair of his pants and brought them to Chris. So he went on stage a few minutes later, had pants on, and he just said, can you believe that? Is there any mm -hmm. other hotel that would have done that? <laughs> wow, so. that's a fantastic story there. <laughs> and I think all it took at that point of time, Adrian, perhaps you'll agree with this, was common sense and presence of mind. Yeah. You know, It's not like they uh, uh, got somebody to stitch a brand new pair of trousers for him. I mean, it was they found somebody who could do that. And that's presence of mind. But that also um, a culture that allows people to take these sort of decisions. In another environment, people would be so scared to do something. Uh, probably the phrase, and I've worked eight years in the hospitality industry, and you would probably hear a phrase which goes something like this. Uh, you know, I, I'm sorry, that's not my job, right? Yeah. And oh, it, yeah. technically, you would be right. You would be right. It, it's probably not your job to do that, but it's a culture that enables. Love the fact that you shared that story. Um, now, it, my, the next thing that I wanted to come to was, uh, yeah. a, as a business leader, what are these specific steps you feel that I can yeah. take today? Um, you know, regardless of the size of the organization, maybe, maybe I'm a small and medium enterprise, maybe I'm a large organization or a startup. Are there practical, simple steps that I can start taking today in order to create such a culture? And the nice thing is, is that no matter what size of organization you work with, I mean, we work with small nonprofits of, uh -huh. uh, you know, 100 employees all the way up to, to GE and uh, Ford and, and different companies that are just massive. Right. And no matter wh what, where you are, what size of organization, every organization deals with the same constraints. My mm -hmm. budgets are tight. Mm -hmm. uh, you think, oh, no, those big companies, they've got money to burn. No, they don't. Their mm -hmm. budgets are tight. They're trying sure. to think of ways to do things that are cost uh -huh. little to nothing. And the good news is, if you're a leader, there's a lot you can do that doesn't cost much, and, and, and it's all on you. For example, mm -hmm. the first step we found that great leaders do in these cultures is they define what we call the burning platform. Okay. So think about this. You're, you're, in the, you're in the ocean, you know, you're off the coast of, of India, and you are, you're in an oil derrick, and you're pumping oil, and all of a sudden, the derrick behind you starts burning. Well, looking down, it's 100 feet down into the, the scary Indian Ocean. I'm going right. to jump. 
But the only reason you'll jump is if something's scarier behind you, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the same in our in our work lives. What we do as leaders, we say, we've got a new customer service initiative. Mm -hmm. We have a new, we want everybody to be innovators. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, why would I care about that? Mm -hmm. We don't give anybody really the burning platform to explain why we mm -hmm. need to jump into this new world. Sure. So the first thing we found that great leaders do in these cultures mm -hmm. is they're very clear about mm -hmm. the competitive environment. This right. is why we have to change. Right. This is why this new way of behaving is very important. Sure. Yeah, they focus on mission, vision, values, but they explain right. why uh -huh. those are important. And also, you know, and sometimes, you know, we do a lot of executive coaching, my, mm -hmm. my co-author Chester and I, Yep. And we'll ask the leader, we'll say, okay, when did you talk last about the vision of your your team, your your organization? And they'll often mm -hmm. say, no, no, it's good, Adrian. We talked about this in January with mm -hmm. our team. We set up the year for them. <laughs> and I'll say, great. Well, when have you, what have you done this week to mm -hmm. help them understand the vision mm -hmm. of the, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you do the same with your clients. Yeah, this sure. is not a one-time thing. Uh -huh. You have to constantly communicate where we're going, how are we going to get there? And I think it's important to reinforce the the cultural values, you know, um, to whether it's stories such as the one that you shared for Ritz Carlton. Um, and I keep coming back to that because I, I, I read about this that they share throughout their hotel briefings. And I've attended one, I've conducted many, you know, worked in food and beverage operations with large hotel companies across the world. They, they circulate these stories of people going above and beyond. Um, and they pick one story for the day and every hotel briefing across every red squadron in the world will get to hear that that story of some employee who went beyond the call of duty and did something to reinforce those cultural values and i think that's a great way that's great peer-to-peer -peer learning it's not just coming from the leader to the to the rest of the team it's also coming from you know people are having conversations that revolve around that now having said that the times that we live in Currently, I think Gallup's number for India in terms of employee engagement and India and the rest of the world, not very different. We, the engagement rates are around 10 to 14 percent engaged at work, um, 60 odd percent, 60 something percent disengaged. And um, that are the remaining, that's around 27, 28, 29 percent actively disengaged. Uh, the conversations in, in an environment like that, and especially the last two years that we've been through, you know, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of retrenchments, uh, pay cuts, so on and so forth, have not been very pleasant. So the conversations are not the most optimistic at the moment, which has resulted in a phenomena that we've all heard about, the great resignation, um, <laughs> resulting in a war for talent. When you have a handful of people available, there's a war for talent. People leaving um, employee, employers for just a 10% raise or a 20% raise. Uh, tough times to, for, for people to manage their, their organizations. Any tips in this changing environment where, where perhaps the, the playing ground has changed, the rules have changed? Uh, what should leaders do, in, especially in this transition period where we're not sure yet? Are we going back to hybrid? Are we going back to work from home? Are we, what does the new normal look like? So any tips yeah, for leaders? I, uh, mm -hmm. I, I've got nothing. No, no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, a few things. You know, first off, I love this, um, you know, that you're, you're framing this point as a big question, and it is. Because mm -hmm. this great resignation, I, I've always thought of it as sort of the great reassessment. Right. The people, we, all of a sudden we realize, hey, I don't have to get up at six in the morning, drive through traffic, you right. know, fight and claw my way up uh -huh. for, for, for what? Then come home at eight o'clock at night, never see the family. Yeah. Um, you know what? I'm just as productive at home. Mm -hmm. and, and yet uh, you said earlier, leaders want their people to come back. And that's what yep. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my clients, they're they're building, a, you know, here in the U.S., a multi, multi-million, tens of millions of dollars, big building. Uh -huh. right. And because the CEO wants it and his right. people are telling him, you know, nobody wants to come back to this. Yeah. You're building mm -hmm. a big glass monolith. Right. And he says, yeah, but I want people to work together. And he says, mm -hmm. and his people are telling him, we have to figure out ways where we can do this differently mm -hmm. because our people are happier. They're more engaged. They're more productive when we're, like you said, it's a hybrid world. Right. So when we think about this, a couple of things that come to mind, you know, first off, uh, we have to realize the old ways of working aren't coming back. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, we may want them to, we may try and force them to, mm -hmm. um, but we're going to be alone if we do that. Sure. So we have to think a little differently. Mm -hmm. Now, now we've done a lot of work on surveying different uh, generations, different demographics, and doesn't matter if you're in India or in the U.S. or mm -hmm. or in Germany. There's one group that actually does want to come back into the office more, and that's people in their 20s, younger people. Mm, they right. actually value interaction, and right. they want coaching and mentoring. It doesn't mean they want to be there five days a week, right. but they want to be there more because uh -huh. they actually want some career guidance and direction, sure, sure. And, and that interaction doesn't mean everybody. Right. Now, there's no broad brush strokes here, mm -hmm. but we're seeing more younger people who do actually want to be together, mm -hmm. but more older workers, people in their 50s, 60s who say, I've done that, mm -hmm. uh, even 40s, 50s, 60s saying, I've done that, I want a little bit more flexibility. Sure. So this is where we start looking at how we create a hybrid workplace uh -huh. You know, there's two words that are really key as, as we consult with organizations. The first is flexibility, that we right. have to be a little different than we've ever been. Uh -huh. The second is empathy. Uh, this is empathetic leadership has truly mm -hmm. risen as one of the most important drivers of sure. engagement today, uh, where we didn't worry about this at all, even a couple of years ago. You know, mm -hmm. you left your personal self at the, at the door. You got a problem, right. you know, you deal with it. Uh -huh. Now... I need my manager to be involved with with what I'm going through. Sure. And so managers have different charges. Mm -hmm. They have to help build a hybrid workplace where if I am coming into the workplace, then make it worth my while. Absolutely. We're going to work together collaboratively on those right. days that I'm there. I'm not just sitting working what we call parallel work uh -huh. where I'm sitting next to somebody, but we're not really interacting. Not interacting. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's a great point. And the second that's a great is point. that empathy mm -hmm. idea. Yeah. Please. Yeah. yeah. The second, the second you said is empathy. Um, it is. And that's yeah. different than sympathy. You know, sympathy mm -hmm. is, I'm strong, you're weak, let me help you. Empathy mm -hmm. is, you know, we've all gone through tough things over the last two years. Uh, we've all lost people. We've all mm -hmm. faced tough challenges. Yeah. I, I know where you're coming from when you're struggling. What can I do to help with the work environment so we can get you through whatever you're feeling and facing? Absolutely. And I think that that inclusive so, sort of mindset um, is is now a must. It's an entry requirement for it should be like a criteria that every manager should meet is that I understand what, what we've all been through together. I understand the advantages as well as but you have to be a mentor where you if you want them back, you have to give them a little bit extra in terms of what it means for them than just being sitting there physically present. I, I read about this uh, it's called the presenteeism bias, yeah. uh, which means managers would think somebody's putting in extra hard work if they can see them all the time, uh, yeah. <laughs> rather than in a from their home office or wherever they're working. So rightly said, I think, I will just want to build upon that, uh, what you just said a little bit more, is that managers and leaders, we, we need to create an environment at the workplace where people have a little bit extra than they would working from home, whether that's mentorship, whether that's collaboration, whether that's humor and bonding at work, whether that is <clears throat> some form of human connection, which is unavailable uh, in a virtual environment. And that should do the job, that should do the job of bringing people together if that really helps the organizational agenda, if that really fuels the innovation, if that really fuels the collabor collaboration. If you have to have people back, you need to give them a little bit extra. Thanks, thanks for that, Adrian. Uh, my, my next thought at the, the, is about employee engagement, which is the, with which our discussion started with. Um, and you've done extensive research on the subject um, across the world. You know, you, you've had these uh, surveys coming in from more than half a million people, I believe. Um, and I would like to ask, uh, in terms of employee engagement, what what are the factors in in terms of the culture of the organization, um, and that makes employees want to come back to work the next day? Um, what draws them? What what kicks? What yeah. gets their intrinsic motivation fired up? What brings them in? In yeah. your research, that, that's interesting. You do bring up intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic because really mm -hmm. both are important. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of psychologists will tell you it's all about intrinsic motivation. And actually, there are times in our career where extrinsic is very important, again, especially for younger people. Right. Uh, I need to know that my work is, is valued, is important. Uh -huh. As I get older in my career, I become much more intrinsic, uh, intrinsically driven. You don't need to be telling me every day, pat me on the back. Mm -hmm. um, 
but there are different times in our careers. So one of the things we found in engagement, uh -huh. um, and you ask, you know, culturally, what can we do? Because there are some broad brush strokes we can sure. do culturally. Uh, right. For example, we found no matter if you were in India or if you were in China, you're in, in, in Great Britain, uh -huh. doesn't matter. The number one driver of engagement are, are, is a concept we coupled together. It's called opportunity and well-being. In okay. other words, I have the opportunity to do my best work every day. I have the opportunity to grow and develop. So mm -hmm. I'm, I have opportunity, mm -hmm. but also well-being. Somebody cares about my well-being. Mm -hmm. Typically, it's mm -hmm. my manager. Right. If those are in place... That, those are the number one drivers. Now, what gets really interesting is every country then starts getting very different in what drives mm -hmm. engagement. Mm -hmm. But what, what the big aha is, so mm -hmm. I know, and you probably do this too, as, you, as I go into an organization, if I'm, if I'm working with the senior leadership team, there are things I can do to spike engagement levels very quickly. Right. Um, we can work on, you know, my voice is heard. So we make sure that Managers are trained on listening techniques so that mm -hmm. the people feel valued and that their their opinions are, are valued. We we focus on future vision so uh -huh. that the, they really have an understanding of where this organization is going over and over again. Recognition is an easy spike. Mm -hmm. So there are things culturally we can do to help. But here's the real secret of engagement mm -hmm. is that it's individual. Um, the broad brush strokes help. But you will never have a truly engaged organization until managers understand that what motivates you is very different than what motivates me, that motivates right. her, that motivates the next person. Sure. We're all very unique and different. And mm -hmm. that's hard. Mm -hmm. And managers go, I don't have time for that. I have 20 right. people who work for it. It takes a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. It takes effort. But mm -hmm. if you want to move engagement numbers, you have to go person by person to figure out what my motivators are, what I'm going to be engaged by. Um, it's very different for me than than for you or anybody else. Absolutely. Or, or as Ken Blanchard says, uh, different strokes for different folks, right? Yeah, um, exactly. You got to you got to figure out. You have to figure out. Uh, and, and I think it's all about uh, emotional labor. Uh, whether it's customer service at Ritz Carlton that we talked about, whether it's managers trying to figure out what drives this individual, it's just about putting in a little bit of mental effort there um, rather than trying to pigeonhole everybody into the same compartment together and, and, and hope that they respond to the same stimulus as everyone else, which won't be the case, obviously. Um, now, talk to us about teams, because um, I, I read this on your website that a major 96% of executives say that uh, poor teamwork, poor collaboration is one of the number one reason why organizations go off track, why all these initiatives fail in the long run. Um, what can I do as a leader to promote teamwork and collaboration? Um, in because what can I do to get people rowing together in the same direction? Given the fact that I have these variable numbers of engagement, I have the 10% highly engaged, I have the 30% actively disengaged who are probably putting in their effort every day to undermine what everybody else is doing. Given the fact that these numbers reflect sort of the reality of every organization, um, how do I, what practices as a leader should I follow to get people rowing in the same direction? You know, it's, it's, it's another good question. And one of, the, one of the things that you can do, again, it's the low-hanging fruit, uh -huh. is to be able to use recognition in creative ways to break down these silos. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, one of the leaders we've studied over the years, is, his name is Bill Manning. Um, in uh, Toronto, Canada, okay. he's the president of the local uh, soccer team, the football team there, right. and uh, they called uh, Toronto FC. And mm -hmm. when he started in 2014 as the president, they hadn't even made the playoffs. And uh, three years later, they won the the entire major league you know, soccer championship. So then they they go and play in the uh, in the you know the Conca whatever it is the world uh, championships against Real mm -hmm. Madrid and other things so they've oh, done wow. some really remarkable things uh -huh. but he also season tickets he's tripled season ticket sales etc so when he says I got there mm -hmm. he says my teams and I've heard this from so many managers my mm -hmm. teams were siloed marketing wouldn't talk to sales sales wouldn't talk to finance human resources didn't like anybody he says <laughs> everybody was in their little silos right right. And he says, I had to break that down. So he says, uh, 
a, a football team, a soccer team, and we've worked with Fulham in England, we've worked with others around the world. He says, they're typically a small group. You know, you see hundreds of people on game day on Saturday, but mm -hmm. he says, those are all part-timers. Our core team is about 60 people. Okay. He says, so on Monday mornings, I, I, had a, I started a staff meeting. Everybody comes, no excuses. You come to the morning, Monday morning staff meeting at nine o'clock and we talk about what we're working on. He says, but I always started with recognition. I wouldn't recognize people, he says, but I would call people randomly, uh, you know, and he, and he had a couple of really nice gift certificates okay. to a local, uh, you know, clothing store. Mm -hmm. And he would say, John, you're in sales. Who are you going to recognize today? And it has to be somebody in another team who helped you last week. Oh, wow. And, and so John, and I, when I was in one of these meetings, John mm -hmm. stands up and he says, you know, I'd like to recognize Aaron. He says, because Aaron's in accounting, but when I sell a season ticket and he's so excited for the customer, he says, right. we never lose the sale. We always, he always enhances the sale. Mm -hmm. He's a bookkeeper, mm -hmm. um, but he's making my job better. Right. And, and they were wonderful. There were three of these little moments and he does it mm -hmm. every week. Mm -hmm. And he and so when we left the meeting, Bill says, there's a couple of things that are happening there. First off, during the week, everybody's going, have I done enough to help other teams? Mm. And secondly, who on other teams has helped me? He sure. says, all of a sudden, the walls just started going down. Trumbull, it was right. a very simple little thing, but I thought it was yeah. a brilliant way Great to exercise. really help. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, to get people to work together. Absolutely. And especially when it's another department. So you're not looking at, and this is a misconception that always sort of sets in at some stage in organizations are doing well. The sales department, they, they consider, oh, we're probably doing the most important part here or the finance department or somebody else, right? Uh, while it's, it has to be understood. And that's a great story that you mentioned there, um, that it is always somebody else and some other department who's enabling you to do what you do best, right? And it may appear to our viewers, it's probably just the two of us sitting here having this conversation, sharing all these things with you, adding value, but there's so many people who put, put in so much effort behind the scenes to um, enable this. I'm not sure this, the story was around on LinkedIn somewhere about um, who packs your parachutes. Uh, Adrian, you probably might be familiar with that, right? This fighter pilot mm -hmm. in the Second World War, um, and he walks into this restaurant and he was hailed as a hero for all the all that he did during the war but he walks into this restaurant and some this guy walks up to him and says are you mr so and so you know the fighter pilot is all over the news uh, yes i am um well he said uh, you probably don't know me but i know you for sure i'm the guy who packs your parachutes right who packed your parachute before every single one of those flights and he said i had that at very that very moment the realization um, that they were, they were so many other people contributing in so many different ways to enable that. That's a beautiful story there. And I love the fact that you said the, the low hanging fruit for teamwork, uh, you mentioned is communication uh, would be one, get your people together and, and talk to them. Appreciation, especially if it's in a different department. Um, and I like that as well. So thank you so much, Adrian, for your uh, valuable time here today for these interesting stories. Um, and before we let you go, parting words of uh, inspiration for uh, leaders during this challenging times uh, in order to um, get back to what, whatever the new normal looks like. We don't know what it, what is going to look like. Uh, we don't know if there is a new variant that's going to come and hit the world. We don't know what the next big challenges are. There's, there's many happening right now. There's, the, there's a war in Ukraine. There's so much else uh, happening around the world that, that is probably unsettling for organizations and people. Um, what, in your opinion, would you like to share with leaders in order to make sure that the mindset remains positive for everyone involved? Well, well thanks, Simarjeet, first off, for having me on and for, for your care and concern for your clients as well. You know, it's obvious that, you know, you, this is your passion and, and that's so great to, ha you. to help other leaders. Um, one thing I would say to leaders themselves, too, is that, Put on your oxygen mask first, as they tell mm. you in the airplane, right? <laughs> is, is there so much going on right now? And we ask so much of leaders. Things mm -hmm. are changing. So we've, we've spent 30 minutes here telling leaders how they need to think differently and mm -hmm. act differently. And, and that's important. Right. But, but take care of yourself first. You know, shut off on the weekends. Yep. <laughs> take time. Our mm -hmm. brains need time, not only when we're not working, when we're not thinking about work. So right. do that for yourself and for your people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, make sure you realize you can only control what you can control. Mm 
Absolutely. There's so many elements, like you just mentioned, war in Ukraine, another variants mm -hmm. are coming this fall, etc. You can't control any of that. Mm -hmm. Let that go. You know, right. let it go. Mm -hmm. And focus in on what you can control. That's those things that are within your control. That will help you as you go through this. And finally, find ways to 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 have conversations with people who build you up. Sure. You know, sometimes I'll I'll hear this, you know, I'm going through so much and I'll I'll talk to my significant other or I'll talk to my mom about it. They just mm -hmm. don't understand. They tell me this. They just don't get it. Well, mm -hmm. stop talking to those people. Well, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Nothing about this, you know, right. talk to people who get it and who can sure. help you sure. find a supportive network that will build you up and help you get through these things, because really you do have to keep your tank full as you move forward. So take care Indeed. of yourself first, then you can help others. Indeed, I love the part. And that's precisely the reason why I have this series, uh, Adrian, is to talk to people who build me up. And uh, it, it's great to hear it because from other people, because sometimes you probably already know the concept, you're probably familiar with it, you probably taught it yourself. But when it comes from a different individual who understands those challenges, it really builds you up. And I've had the privilege of speaking to more than 50, 60 people over the last one year. And this is the positive side effect of all the turmoil that happened in the world, you know, with, with the world going virtual. And we were able to reach out to so many wonderful people like yourself. So great advice there. T uh, talk to people who build you up. Fill your own tank first because so much is asked from us because the rest of the world is just waiting out there to drain, to empty our tank. So we must figure out yeah. ways to, to fill it up. Thank you so much, sir. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. Thank you. Thank you, Sumerji. Thanks, everybody, for watching.